for me, the biggest awakening in early motherhood, you know, the first time was like the, like the baby hmm. part was easy. It's like baby diapers, whatever. But like sitting there being like the reality of the world around us kind of like coming to light in my like fresh, vulnerable postpartum eyes was like a very rude awakening. And that's what I didn't know how to talk to anybody about. It was like, how do I like tell people like, yeah, the baby's great, but like I'm having an existential crisis about the patriarchy. Like, can we talk about that? This is Raising Mama, a hilariously honest podcast dedicated to unveiling the hidden realities of motherhood. Our goal is to arm you with the information and tools you need to be your most confident and empowered self. This podcast is packed with unfiltered testimonies, diverse perspectives, and expert opinions, along with a good dose of laughter and tears. Leading you on this journey is my best friend, Megan Stander, who is a CEO passionate maternal health advocate, and mom of two daughters. Alongside me is my best friend, Chelsea Ledson, who is a mother, wife, and registered nurse with her master's specializing in women's health. Let's try to raise the next generation by raising up mamas and maybe raising a little hell. Hey, y'all. Hey, mamas. Welcome back to Raising Mama. On today's episode, we have Jenny Tucker. She is the leader and founder of Centerline Community, a virtual postpartum support community and meetup platform. With over 700 mamas enrolled in her programs, Jenny would like to share the most common struggles women face when entering motherhood and how debunking common misconceptions can help new mothers adjust with more ease. So join us today as Jenny shares freely what she wishes she knew before giving birth. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. Hello. So glad to be here. All right. Well, let's dig on into it. So what do you think after you've kind of been there supporting all these mamas, what do you think are the most common themes that new moms are struggling with? The most common thing I hear, I feel like from both moms I work with personally and just like moms anywhere is why did no one tell me? (laughs) And it's like, okay, the only reason (laughs) we're all here is because people keep having babies. So like, this is happening forever and ever and ever. But yet still in 2024, it's like, why did no one tell me even with all the social media and like vulnerable shares, you can Google anything. Moms still don't really know what it's like until they enter into that postpartum phase, which is partly because you can't know until you're in it, which both of you, Chelsea and Megan, you know that once you're in it, you're like, oh, I've heard people maybe describe a little bit of this. If you had, you know, you're lucky enough to have someone be real with you, but you really can't know what it's truly like until you're in it. But like, even more than that, what I found having babies and what I hear from all the moms that I'm in group with or coaching is that no one told them the reality of it. And for me, realizing that like having a baby and then feeling passionate about working with moms, because I felt like there was no support. It was also during COVID. So that was a totally different time. There's literally nothing. And then, but even when, you know, that went away, it was like, oh, there must be more stuff now that more stuff is available because the world's back on. It's like, no, we just don't care about moms. It's like how I felt. (laughs) So, which I have to laugh at because it's like so deep and dark that I like can't Mm -hmm. dwell on how, like the despair I feel around that fact. But so started Centerline out of this need for connection and support for moms. We live in a culture that doesn't value educating people on new motherhood. So even though people keep doing it and moms keep having babies, like we learn about adolescence through textbook after textbook, scientist after scientist studies this, no one's studying motherhood. And it's like to, to, for a kid to become a teen and be an adolescent, like a mom needs to have that baby. It's like that part is just like forgotten about. So the biggest struggle I see is that people just don't know, even though we're all doing it. Like we we don't even feel empowered to share to the level that moms need to know. So yeah, biggest struggle is you, you are, you feel like you get your ass kicked entering early motherhood because <laughs> there's no way to prepare. It feels like. So if you're like a, a, a soon to be mother listening to right now, listening to this right now, what, what would you tell her? That? Yeah, right? Cause it's kind of scary. Yeah. They're like, okay, cool. So I can't know till I'm in it. Like, what do I do? I would tell her to like, look at people in her life, right. That are mothers or like even mom adjacent, like people who have been exposed to something like early postpartum birth, um, people that you trust, um, and like have conversations and like dig into it. Like I early on started feeling like, yeah, there's going to be like, as I inch closer to birth, I felt like 
people around me didn't know a lot of things, even people who had had birth or like, uh, um, Mm -hmm. or given birth and people who I was needing a C-section. I'm like looking to people who have had C-sections and like the conversation wasn't there. It was like, can you like, tell me more? Like, why is there this like barrier between us talking about this? Like, it felt like certain moms are like, like either they lock away their experience because maybe it's hard to talk about or like they weren't supported early on. So like, it's hard to go back there. I think with previous generations, that's for sure the case. Like our moms literally withhold support from us because they're like, well, I didn't get it. Why should I give it to you? It feels like this weird gatekeeping, even, even that moms and women are doing. So like look to people in your life who are open, or maybe you don't know if they are, but like you can do a little digging to be like, Hey, can you tell me about when you gave birth? Some people are like, so excited to talk about it because no one's ever asked them so it's like finding people in your life that you can like like crack the door open and be like can we like talk about this some people you won't get much and that's okay because that's not their fault most likely but for other people it's like you might get a little something and then I really believe that's how we like open things up more to really talk about the reality of postpartum I feel like you touched on so many things there because one thing that I heard was yes it is hard to get people to open up. But similarly, it's hard to like, if you've never been through something to even know what to ask. And motherhood is so nuanced that it's like, I think a great thing to make is a list of questions to ask like your mother or somebody you trust, because maybe that's half the battle is knowing what to ask. And then the third thing I thought you said that was just so cool is that I never thought about gatekeeping that like possibly people don't want to share because that's just how it was for them. And it's like, they want you to learn. They learn the hard way, which is definitely a way to learn, but it's not the only way to learn, you know? And so it is funny that in this information age, it's like this one thing that all these people go through is still kept a big secret when there's no reason for it to be so secretive. I keep thinking like I've, I've been sort of thinking about this, while we're talking about it and i'm i'm wondering if part of it has to do with the fact that like it's almost like there isn't any resolution to it because you you never like i mean this this might be true with less true with second time moms because they which i know we're going to talk about later and how their experiences are different but like if you've only had one kid and someone asks you a question about like, you know, it's kind of like, well, I, I don't know. I, w- I wasn't prepared either. And like, I just had to like figure it out. And, and then I think on top of that, of course, like you're, you're scared to scare people. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, it's, I think it's difficult to find a way of delivering that information without scaring them off or like upsetting them but in reality you're you're doing them a favor but you have to make it like constructive i guess like you can't just be like oh it's gonna be fucking insane and like right shit sucks <laughs> like you have to like give some kind of you know like lead a little trail of candy or like whatever like keep them learning yeah. more without like getting scared away you're like luring them like over to the dark side kind of to be like there's some shit that's going to happen. And like, I, that's the thing is like, I feel like, yeah, the more, the more of us that can be open up about it to be like, Hey, here, like, that's a problem I run into with my business all the time is like trying to get buy-in from expecting parents. You need this support. Now you need to be learning about this now. They're like, Oh, we'll just like wait and see, which is what your pediatrician tells you, which is what your OB tells you. Oh, you're having pain there. Let's just wait and see. Oh, he's doing this. And you have a weird feeling about it. Let's just wait and see. That's right. Our, our culture that's the the fallback is like let's not let's not get to the root cause of something let's like wait until you suffer through it and like enough that you like are desperate (laughs) and need help and then like maybe we'll give you something (laughs) like so it's Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. like going back to right and it feels like you said Megan like there's no resolution because like the resolution is so big which is like like right reverting back to like a culture and society that values women, which like really is what it comes down to. And that's like, for me, the biggest awakening in early motherhood, you know, the first time was like the, like the baby Hmm. part was easy. It's like baby diapers, whatever. But like sitting there being like the reality of the world around us kind of like coming to light in my like fresh, vulnerable postpartum eyes was like a very rude awakening. And that's what I didn't know how to talk to anybody about. It was like, how do I like 
tell people like, yeah, the baby's great, but like, I'm having an existential crisis about the patriarchy. Like, can we talk about that? Like, how do you go meet a mom friend at the park and talk about that? But like, you know, she's feeling it too. (laughs) Let's get into the specifics here. I mean, what were, what were like the, 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 the key things that made you like just riled up about it? Oh, like from your specifics personal that I think we can all relate to, or it's like, once you think about it, then you're like, oh yeah. Like, you know, after my C-section having, you know, maybe a two week checkup initially, which I think maybe was over the phone during COVID. And then, um, at six weeks going in for a checkup and they didn't give an internal exam. They didn't touch my incision. They just gave me a survey about, you know, the Edinburgh depression exam and you answer 10 questions. And they're like, okay, do you have any questions? Bye. And you're like, so like, is that so, and they're like, no, you can go now. And like leaving that office being like, and they literally scheduled my annual after that. And they're like, see you in a year. And you're like, so that's, that's it. Like that's, that's it. And feeling like, yeah, Yeah. driving home and getting home and being like, this is fucked up. And then thinking about the different layers of that as an example, right? Like different things that, that all moms need that like they, that are, either kept from us or they're not brought up in that appointment. Like every mom should be set up with a therapy appointment, not taking that dumb 10 question exam. Like you should be seen six times minimum with a therapist at like, let's say during those six weeks, every week, you should have a six week pelvic floor exam after your six week, all clear. You should go get an internal exam. These things that are, it's like every mom in the world, every, you know, most let's say women in the world are going to give birth. I used an example on Instagram recently where my husband jammed his finger in a rec league basketball game, had to get surgery on it, got eight weeks of required PT that was fully covered by insurance. He got all these forms, all these exercises. When I left the OB, nothing. Didn't even touch me. See you in a year. It's like, I just had a fucking baby and a C-section and you're, you give me nothing. That was like the kind of the intro. Cause I was kind of like in those first six weeks of like, hmm. maybe this is like going to get better. This is very soupy and gray. You know, I'm six weeks in like, you know, it's up and down. I'm just gonna like, again, wait and see. <laughs> then like go to six weeks and be like, oh, they're going to like, give me some answers. Like I'm feeling some stuff. And then just nothing. That's like when centerline, like the community I run now kind of went full force was like, we got to do better. Like we got to at least get the moms together for me to be like, do you guys like, did this happen to you too? And then them be like, yeah. And then it was like this cloud lifting. Whereas I feel like so many moms after let's say an experience like that, or even in that appointment, I asked for pelvic floor PT. Cause luckily I had a friend who suggested it and the doctor said, why? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, I don't know. I just heard it was a good idea. She's like, well, if there's no pain, like I I need a reason to put in the computer. So like, I, there isn't one. It's like, I don't know. I just had fucking surgery. Like, you know, thinking of my <laughs> husband and his damn finger, like, is this a joke? So, Like, yeah. When it feels like there's no resolution. And even in my job where it's like, this feels like so big of a task to like, right. Fix this. But like every mom that we can like crack that door open and be like, Hey, like this isn't how it's supposed to be is like, maybe you're improving that experience. And then maybe she's not going to be the mother-in-law right now who says like my friend told me her mother-in-law literally said she was standing there in the kitchen two kids are tantruming she turns her mom and goes can you help me she goes I didn't have help so why literal quote so why should I help you (laughs) which is like such the kind of mo of a lot of I think women that age or mothers who had to mother in a time where there was nothing like this podcast there was nothing like centerline they literally Mm -hmm. had to white knuckle it and get through and then now yeah it's like that's their trauma response I'm trying to help moms avoid doing that to their daughters. It's funny because like even in the maternity leave reels that we make on our, on our Instagram, the, the, the comments from men, like we had this one where we're dancing to that, like Beyonce song, this ain't Texas or whatever. And it was really just supposed to be like a fun play on that song. It, really wasn't supposed to be about Texas, but for some reason, the algorithm, like three weeks later, decided to show it to men in Texas, like by the thousands. And we got like thousands upon thousands of comments from these men. And the number one comment was like, you think like having a baby is like being disabled. Like you're just like a bunch of like lazy ass, like people like, uh, you know, trying to get money from the government. And I was like, okay, if you ever had a baby, you would fucking know that like, yes, you are disabled. Are you kidding me? Like, and and I I wonder too, like how these people 
I'm like, you must have known women that had right. babies. Do you have or like, a wife? Yeah, you know, you, yeah. do you have a wife? Do you have, and a lot of them have kids. And I'm like, oh, you what? Have you, how, how far like you have removed from this experience so, are you? If men of- had to go yeah. through birth, it would be so much better. Like the medical care would be so much better. Imagine what they're getting for their finger like <laughs> tomorrow. Eight, eight like, weeks? Congress would be like, like – Five years off for all men getting pregnant and going through, you know, like things would just be a little different. And, and I know also too, there's definitely the argument of like, yes, no, pregnancy is not disabled in the sense that like, you can't still do a ton of things. And it doesn't mean you're just like debilitated. Same with your fucking finger. Right, right. Exactly. It just doesn't mean that you're exactly the same. Like you're not a person who's going through that while working. is not the same as a person with a broken finger who's working. There's going to be a few accommodations that need to happen. And I would argue that I'm a baby sorry, is- but if you can't even like sit properly, like, yeah, I don't know. I it's go to the bathroom. It's a yeah. war zone down there. I mean, yeah. it's it's a war zone in your brain, in your vagina, in your just yeah your whole body well it's a major like you said jenny it's like this huge sort of like whoa like you thought you knew what the world was about it wasn't like you didn't have an idea this stuff existed but then it just comes like crashing in and knowing that you're now part of it and it's just such a disillusionment i think for a lot of moms maybe not all moms and something you spoke to jenny that i think is really interesting because you were saying how you know, you were looking towards like the medical system to support you, which as you know, I'm a nurse, you know, I've definitely worked in the system. It's, it's such a interesting thing to me because for sure, right. For the vast majority of women having babies, they weren't looking towards the medical system. Do you know what I mean? And I wonder like where, if you were to study this, like anthropologically, like this system of like like you what you're doing right now, women supporting women, that was for sure the main way that people got knowledge, got support, you know, went through this journey together. And then somehow it's like it became very isolated. Like you said, there is sort of this generation of like white knuckling that happened. And then this idea that like, oh, the medical system will support you. And like newsflash, <laughs> the medical yeah, system don't care is about you. <laughs> not going to yeah. support you. You know, it's like they're just a business like anything else. You know, they're just there to – They basically just make sure that you don't die. And they do Mm -hmm. a pretty shitty job at that too. So, yeah. Yeah. And so that's why it's so great that you are like putting these huge communities together because I think in this modern era, like that is the number one thing that is lacking. And again, it's not like I've read a million studies, but I I am just guessing that that is just not – how it was even uh, even probably the generation before our moms and certainly before oh, yeah. that and before that. But it's also what's unique and different too is now more than ever, it's like women have way more roles than it used to be like you get to be, you know, basically you're a mom or you're like a spinster, you know? <laughs> and so now yeah. it's like – it's it's very interesting. We almost have these different roles and it's like the, the world is not accommodating for this new type of woman. A lot of the things that were really useful are going away and the things that we need are not created. So it's oh, so I'm just so pumped that you're doing this. <laughs> oh, thank you. And yeah, you spoke to so much, but especially with others in my community, uh, like colleagues could speak way more specifically to what you're talking about with like sort of when this turned, like, um, but basically like, yeah, the, the art of like midwifery care and women, you know, supporting women through birth, like at one point, whatever OB was like, oh, you can't do that anymore. Now we do it and women give birth on their backs. And then it was like this whole wave of like, not like right things that again patriarchy like support these other functions of our modern society that was starting to thrive that again women these things don't support women like the hospital model like I just was posting about um you know diving into what I know we have too on the docket is like the second time mom wisdom being like giving birth to my first son in the hospital and being like I'll do whatever you say because again like I don't want to die like out of fear like whatever you guys say I'll do it because you know best but like having gone through this you know, a million things, existential crisis, like huge, painful downfall, realizing, you know, the world's 
lack of value for motherhood and women. And then sort of coming out the other side and having another baby, which by the way, for anyone listening, who's like, has one. And then is like, I don't know how I could do this with another one. Like I had so many feelings when I got pregnant with my second. And especially when I found out it was a girl, like so excited and, and hopeful, but also like kind of had, I don't know, again, those like doom and gloom feelings of like, I don't, I don't know how I could do this mm. with another. This is already so hard, but also at the same time, right. It's like in motherhood, you feel two opposite things at the same time. But I always just like to really give voice to like the most vulnerable stuff I can to be like, there were dark days when I found out I was pregnant because I was like, I, I don't know how I feel about this. And of course, came around, had a baby. And when I went into the hospital that second time, needed another C-section, I was like, this is in my hands now. Like whatever during those two <laughs> years happened, this like awakening, um, which I'm still sort of in, like I, the second time mom wisdom and confidence, like I feel like for me being surrounded by so many moms through something like Centerline and being in a community like Santa Barbara um, that has a lot of resources, I was able to like, when I talked about like cracking the door open, like I was able to like crack my own like wide open and like feel all these things and sort of like heal from this stuff that maybe as a woman in America all this time, I was like kind of shoved down. You guys are nodding. I know what you know what you might like. It's hard to talk about, but I know you know what I mean. Like, like I feel like most women are, are, like you, if you don't get that support or like you don't feel seen and heard, then the doors just slam shut and you have to like get it back together and like go back to work and like don't talk about your existential crisis because like you're a mom and you're a working mom and you got to make money and you got to do all these things. And it's like, there's no room to like. And people give you shit about it. Oh my God. People they're straight like, up give you shit up. about it. Yes. And then, yeah, other moms, I feel like if you yeah. bring it up and they're not there, then they're like, wait, what? Like. <laughs> So yeah, it's like finding, yeah, people who will like jam on this stuff with you like this, like, yay, I'm so glad I found you guys. Mm -hmm. And then going back to, yeah, going in the hospital the second time, like feeling, feeling in my bones, how backward everything was like going in there to give birth and just the way they treated me, the way they talked to me, the way they tried to take my baby from me dozens of times, like off my chest. And I was like, you know, confident in my second time mom wisdom, like, no, no, no. I've done that before. I've done the separation. I've tried to stop him crying alone in the bassinet. Like that's not going to work this time. She's right here. That's what I want. And they were like, not about that. It's like the hospital was not set up for that. There's signs hmm. everywhere that say, do not sleep with your baby on your chest. When like you were talking to Chelsea, like the way that we're biologically made and the way that this used to happen, like that's the only place the baby would be. And it's like, here we are day one being like, <laughs> let me put him in a plastic bassinet because that's what's better for the hospital because we don't want you to sue us if he falls. It's like, well, that's not what's better for me right now. Like, what if we set up safe bed sharing mm -hmm. in the hospital instead? Like, think about how much less stressful that would be. Like, I can remember those first two nights in the hospital, baby right. screaming, me awake because I'm not supposed to sleep with him and like getting sleep deprived and feeling like I said to my husband, like, I feel like I'm on a crack binge. Like, I don't, I feel out of control. And that's because <laughs> I was up for two nights. I've never done crack. <laughs> I feel like that's what it would be like. Like, so <laughs> wired and being like, and looking back, I'm like, it's because your baby wanted to be on you. But the signs everywhere said, don't let your baby sleep on you. So the first time I listened, the second time I was like, fuck that. This baby's staying on me. I don't care. Like, I will sign whatever you want me to sign. And like, that's the second time mom wisdom that was centerline too, that I'm trying to expose pregnant couples to is like, I don't want you to go through that first time and like suffer through and have to go through the giant existential crisis. Some of it's necessary, but some of it, I'm like, we could do without some of this pain. Like we could just support you through it. So you don't have to like be at the very bottom of your soul and then like climb your way back out. You know, it's obviously with the medical system, like barely, if at all supporting us, that's where support is so important. And that's why Centerline is so amazing. But, you know, part of that is, is, is making those connections and making mom friends. So, but why, why is making mom friends so difficult? Because I've definitely experienced this too. And I had a, I came up with some weird ass ways to make mom <laughs> friends. It's hard making friends as an adult, like period. Mm -hmm. um, because you're not, you know, it's basically like your social circles are basically like work, which it can be difficult to mm -hmm. uh, tr transitional work friendship into like an outside of work friendship. Um, I just, that's something I found weird in general with culture, at least in California, um, because I'm, I'm from South Africa and in South Africa, stuff like that doesn't happen. Um, people are a lot more, more fluid with, with friendships and it's a bit easier, but then like on top of that, as a mom, I think it's harder to make friends with people that don't have kids. So then you have to like find other mom friends. But 
Why is this so difficult? Such a good question because it is so difficult. And like you mentioned, making friends as an adult is more difficult because there's less, you know, I think about school and college or like clubs or like whatever you're doing. It's like easier to just be like, hey, I'm Jenny. And like, it's like you said, more fluid. And then somehow when we like go in the working world and like go out and kind of like start creating this nuclear family life, even before we have one, it's like, oh, I'm in my apartment with my routine and my stuff. And I'm going to like, yeah, try. it's like we, as we grow older, it feels like like this shell kind of comes over us where we're like less available, less fluid. I like that word that you said, like, you know, you think about being in college being like, let's be friends with everybody. <laughs> and then, yeah, you get into this yeah. like modern adult world and then you find maybe a partner or start to have a family. And it's like, you get so much more isolated, our house, our property. I even like when I walk around my neighborhood and I see like private property, keep off. It like makes me laugh because I'm like, as humans, we're meant to be connected. <laughs> Here we are like totally missing it. Not that I want to like go live on a commune, but like communal living kind of sounds cool with like a bunch of moms. I want to like, go live and, on a commune. <laughs> yeah. Like when you think about it, like, that makes more sense when it comes to having babies. We're not meant to be in a house alone, especially dad goes back to work. My, my husband went back to work in 11 days because of the nature of his job. And it was like, I, I was sitting there being like, I am, I know I'm not meant to be here alone. Like I got to find some people. So I think that's one reason it's so hard is because we're already like so isolated. It's like so much work to get ourselves and the baby out of the house. Think about that. Like when you wake up and you're like, Oh God, like when's the next nap? Have I eaten yet? Or, Oh, this shirt's like milk stained. I got to Like all these things we're handling. So like the mental load before even getting to the garage or the car <laughs> is like exhausting. So then once you figure out getting out in the car, you know, you got to have a plan of where you're going. You got to like, what, find a mom group or like find something on a schedule somewhere. Like the mental load to lead you up to that moment where maybe you meet a friend is like already so taxing for the mom, physically, emotionally, spiritually, like who knows what kind of night you had. And then to have a conversation to be like, and try, you have that stress of most of us have social anxiety anyway. So then you have a baby with you who may or may not be crying or maybe your boobs are filling and you're like, am I leaking? And then you're like, what time is it? If I get in the car before the next nap, should I do it here? Am I going to do it at home? Like, how can you talk to another person and be like, I'm Jenny. <laughs> it's like a joke. Right. So ugh, like with Centerline, we've tried to create spaces to be like, come as you are and even have in there, like, if you want to come and not talk and just like stare at the sky, like do that. Like, we want you to just come. If getting out of the house feels nourishing, come here and sit. If you don't want to chat, great. If you want to chat, great. Like, trying to make it, like, again, more fluid of, like, taking what you need and, like, not having to show up a certain way because, right, you see all these moms on Instagram, or even moms at the coffee shop. Like, I have a hard time approaching a mom who looks totally done up and, like, taking on the day because I'm, like, all, all, already I'm, like, oh, man, like, she's she doesn't want to be my friend. Like, look at me. Like, I... <laughs> I don't have it together. And it's like, that's not true at all. She's struggling too. But like totally. taking down these barriers between each other. So like there's all this pressure, I think. So that's that's a lot of different reasons why <laughs> it's so hard to I, make mom friends. I was thinking about like your your private property keep out comment. Yeah. And like, I think that part of it, and again, this is just like my experience growing up in South Africa. But one of the key differences there was that like, like it's it's okay and normal to like, just go into people's houses, just knock on their door, show up and like go into people's houses or like you're unloading your groceries, your neighbor sees you in the street and they're like, hey, want to come over for dinner? Like that was much more normal. And I feel like when hanging out with people here, especially new people, there's this pressure to like go out, which like you said, then there's all this mental load that comes with this and planning. And I feel like if we could just invite people into our homes and mm. hang out at home, because I got wipes here. I got diapers here. I got food here. You can breastfeed here. You don't need to dress up because you're not going in, pu you're in yeah. public. Like, there's less pressure for everything. And I feel like if we invited people into our homes more, and also if people didn't feel weird about going into our homes, yeah, I feel like it would be like a lot isolation. easier to hang out because, yeah, because like some of my best friends with kids that I love hanging out with, I can just hit them up and go to their house. And we just do nothing together. Like it sucks doing nothing. You're not doing nothing because you're taking care of kids. But like it sucks kind of doing that alone sometimes. And it's nice to just have someone to do that with. What I was reflecting on is I I babysat a lot. Like I was, um, you know, that person who took care of other people's kids and like, you know, used to stay in their houses and 
used to sort of pseudo be a part of pe- many different people's families. I'm a nurse, so I'm a part of many people's very intimate worlds. And I think motherhood is very challenging to connect first and foremost, because it's kind of like money. Like people don't talk about money because there's so many different value systems associated with it. And I think motherhood's like that. Like you don't know Mm. if you go into a patient room and say like, you know, some opinion, if that's just completely against where they're at and what they want, you know, because it's not necessarily either that you just want a mother, right? Like you want somebody who's kind of aligned with the style that you're doing, right? Megan, you could say the style of like, yeah, open my house, come in, don't dress up, it's fine. And that's like your style, you know, but you don't know if you're infringing on their style. And then what's worse is when you're a first time mom, you don't even know what your style is. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as a first time mom, you feel so performative. You want to be showing off like how good you're doing and you want to be that mom in the dress and you want to show how you follow all those discipline books just perfectly. And like you never yell in your house and you always give the perfect like food at the right proportions. And so there's a lot of almost like pretending that's Mm -hmm. happening. And so it's very hard to A, meet real friends when you're performing, and to B, meet real friends if you're not even quite sure what it is you're connecting on. And there's such deep and touchy subjects that you don't just go right into it, like, you know, because you don't want to be upsetting somebody's way of life. You know, it's very personal for each person. And there's a word that is on your website, and I had no idea. I still don't even know how to say it. Um, Megan's like, you don't know this word. But it's the like mat matra essence or Tr- matrescence. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know, yes. dude. I'll have you explain it, Jenny, because I'm sure you know it. But I read that and I was like, oh, that sounds. You're right. It does sound a lot like adolescence. Adolescence is super performative, right? It's super like you're trying to find your peer group, but you don't really know who you're a part of. You like try on these different identities. You, instead of like leaning towards your parents and loved ones, you listen to all this BS that the social media is like pushing on you. And it's kind of this like weird growth phase where you're like finding yourself. And that's why I feel like these second time mamas are like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, they're like out of that phase a bit more. But anyway, explain that word because it was very illuminating for me. Yeah. Okay. I'm so glad that our Centerline's website introduced you to that word. Um of my friend Carly Borden introduced me to that word like eight months postpartum with my son and really like yeah it was like like for many reasons it's funny the way that you're touching on it uh, which I'll loop back to is like a uh it's a super interesting tape but we'll, we'll go full circle on it because um when I was mentioning adolescence earlier it's like you know in school and in in everywhere like if you mention adolescence everyone knows what that is oh yeah that's when you know an 11 or 12 year old like mm-hmm. goes through a funky weird time oh yeah hormones acne yeah, weird activity. They act strange, but we like give them all the grace. And we're like, oh, they're, they're, mm-hmm, you know, they're growing right. up, they're going through it. Hormones, teen years. Yeah, you know. And it's like when a mom is in a similar, if not way more heightened transformation of her matrescence, which really can start in, I like to think that it starts in any like vision you have of yourself becoming a mother. Like that's like the first inklings of your matrescence journey. So matrescence is the, the transition from maiden to mother, essentially. So the transition into your motherhood experience, your role as mom, which in my opinion also never stops. So it's like, like adolescence, it's this huge upheaval and hormonal shift and everything in the beginning. Uh, But because the state of our motherhood changes and our kids grow older, we change. Like, I like to think that it, it goes on forever. But again, there's all this grace for this period of time when teenagers change. And then we go through probably way more than they even do, especially hormonally. If we studied and compared to the hormonal drop and the two days after birth compared to the entire hormone change during those years, like probably way more intense, not to mention birth right before that. And there's no grace (laughs) for moms. It's like, oh, by yeah, two weeks, I better be that mom in the dress and have makeup on and be at the thing. Because like, I, for some reason have no grace for even myself to like take time in this huge transformation that just happened birth and and your yeah you said it's a war zone down there Megan like your body is a war zone aside like your identity just changed in in an instant when you had a baby like it's gonna take years for you to like really pick up the pieces of like what 
has, I like to think of like, if I think of the timeline of my motherhood journey um, or my matrescence journey, let's say, you know, way back when I picture myself as a mom and then do to do, I'm like growing. And, and then here I give birth and on the timeline, it's like, it's like big explosion where like basically everything I know about myself, like I picture a painting, it's like blasted to smithereens. And then like, I both have a blank canvas and like all these pieces on the ground. And it's going to take me a lot more than two weeks or my three months of maternity leave to pick those pieces up and intentionally like weave them back into, let's say this bigger tapestry. Like it's probably going to take me the rest of my lifetime. <laughs> like I picture myself being mm -hmm. maybe 60 yeah. and being like, and like living in the woods somewhere, like maybe on a commune and being like, I found it. Like, I know myself now. <laughs> like, like, think about all the ups and downs of motherhood that we're going to like talk about adolescence when our kids are going through that. Like, we're still going to be picking up those pieces and being like, who am I in this role? But so many of us are like, oh, let me just like pick everything back up and shove it back in and shove myself into my jeans at two weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, and then close the door. So matrescence really lasts so much longer than that. Um, but I like what you said, Chelsea, about the the peer aspect and the pressure when you compare um, matrescence to adolescence, like that there's this, yeah, like, um, again, with that identity, it's like this in an instant kind of this, who am I? And like, and this performative thing happening. And then, yeah, for us, if you really give yourself grace of that happening for years, like imagine what a gift for moms, whereas, you know, same with teens, like you know, once they get to college, maybe they're like kind of figuring it out a little bit, right? Like they're that 60 year old woman, like maybe, or maybe it takes us all till we're 60. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So before we wrap up here, um, we ask all guests this question, but what, what, what like advice or kind of golden nugget of wisdom can you give to our listeners right now? Just like straight from the heart. There's so many things I want to tell new moms. I feel like one of the biggest things that I wish I could have heard is like any of the really hard parts, like it's not your fault and like you are not a worse mother for wondering if this is cut out for, if you're cut out to be a mom, like wondering why did I have this baby? Like really that, like those, those things that not a lot of people shed light to that. Like I've been in some dark moments. I feel like a lot of moms listening maybe are nodding being like, yeah, I've been there. Maybe I'm here now. Like a lot of the reasons motherhood is challenging is because the world around us is not set up to help us thrive. But like, that's not your fault. And like, there are moms here and, and people here to support you, even if it's not who you thought, even if it's not your doctor or your boss or like these systems we rely on, like the reason it's challenging has nothing to do with you. And like, you're doing so much better than you even know. I love it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Thanks. Well, come on, guys. Who wouldn't want to be in a support group with somebody like Jenny? Just like, oh, <laughs> I mean, it just, there's so much there. There's so much value. And I'm so, so, so happy you got to share like a little sliver of it today. But for all you listeners out there, be sure to check out her centerline community, community, community. <laughs> um, she's got all these different virtual and in-person support group opportunities. She also has this amazing newsletter called the mess and the magic. So please go ahead. You could at least sign up for that. Um, she is just really awesome and kind of is starting like a really amazing movement that I'm very happy to be a part of. Glad yeah, we have, have links you. for everything in the in the description. Yeah, it's so nice having you. Um, you can follow her at Centerline Community on Instagram and visit her website at centerlinecommunity.com. Thanks so much, Jenny. Thank you. I hope I get to come back. This is really <laughs> fun. It's not an hour is not enough time. Okay. You will. <laughs> okay. Thank you for tuning in to the Raising Mama podcast. Your presence means a lot, and we hope you found our discussion insightful. To become a part of our community, follow us on Instagram at Raising Mama Podcast. Explore resources on the Raising Mama Village located at www.raisingmama.com. You're never alone on this motherhood journey. We're here to support you every step of the way.